Hey, it's Ilya with Hot Rod Cameras, and you might remember how a few days ago I was talking about how the FX6 is the smallest, lightest, most compact, full-frame digital cinema camera in the world. No more. Uh, this is the Sony FX3, and uh, Sony was nice enough to uh, send this out to us for a very short period of time, and we got to play with it and do some comparison work between it and its uh, siblings. So um, we're gonna take a look at some of that stuff in a minute, but just to give you an idea of really how small this is, it's very similar to an A7S III, except with no viewfinder. And uh, this really cool top handle that is removable, which gives you all sorts of professional audio functions, including two XLR inputs. Um, camera itself has the ports you'd come to expect from a small camera like full-size HDMI. And then hidden behind these flaps with no markings are all the same sort of uh, input outputs that you'd find like on the A7S III, uh, including USB-C, which will charge the camera in the event that you lose your charger or need to also charge an extra battery inside the camera, you can do that. And the real big difference between this and the A7S III is this top handle, the top of the camera where uh, there's not a, a mode dial and no viewfinder, and a bunch of cool mounting points that makes it a lot easier to rig for cinema applications. Super small, super lightweight, clean HDMI output. This is the smallest full-frame digital cinema camera, dedicated digital cinema camera on the market, and uh, it's really, really cool. We only had the camera for a short time, and when it arrived, there was no manual or information provided in any way. So we shot tests of the FX3 next to the FX6, FX9, A7S III, and Red Komodo. Uh, we then brought the footage here and looked at it in 4K on this 10-foot screen. I feel like the best way to describe the FX3 is a cinema version of the A7S III. A7S III is a great camera, but it's first and foremost designed for stills. Uh, not so with the FX3, which offers the big benefit of a motion-centric camera control, uh, clean HDMI output, uh, which works at the same time as the rear LCD, and a professional and removable XLR audio input, which is included with the camera. Uh, for those who own the FX series cameras already and are looking for a smaller camera to match, you will not find an easier camera to match the FX6 or FX9, bar none. The form factor and price is similar to the A7S III, but FX3 should be your automatic choice over the Alpha if any of the criteria we just mentioned are important to you. If it's not, then perhaps the Alpha might make for a good alternative, especially if you're more concerned about taking still photos and you want an EVF. Uh, image quality with the FX3 is extremely similar to the rest of Sony's more expensive FX line, uh, FX6 and 9. Suffice it to say, matching settings and ISO and shooting in a controlled environment, most people will be hard pressed to pick out the difference. The differences are present, of course, but they range from insignificant, meaning they can be measured but are impossible to see under normal circumstances, to perhaps uh, a subtle difference. Uh, take a look at this test we shot in S-Log and applied no color grading other than the standard Sony 709 transform LED. The really novel and unusual feature of the FX camera series is the autofocus. And because the sub 6K cinema camera market is getting really crowded, the autofocus could be a real differentiator. So we wanted to test it extensively. The quality of the FX9 and FX6 autofocus is incredible. So we were wondering if Sony offered the same quality of autofocus in the less expensive FX3 camera. The answer is yes. We shot at F4 in the studio on a 100 millimeter focal length and had our model, Caitlin, walk at a normal to quick pace around 15 feet, turn around and walk back to camera. We did a dozen takes of this and the autofocus system didn't miss her once. While most of our camera breaking tests are never seen in public, we decided to edit one together for you. Here is the context. Lower ISO settings generally equate to lower noise levels. And conversely, a higher ISO setting equates to more noise. Of course, there are exceptions to this, but it's the general rule. Noise is mostly unwanted, but not always, and most easily visible in shadows and midtones. After a quick ISO test, we determined that most people would choose to rate the FX3 between 400 and 800 ISO. This offers a look on 
all the FX cameras with the most dynamic range and the tightest noise pattern. So for our ISO test we're about to show you, uh, instead of shooting in a, a lower light situation, which is typical, we decided to shoot in mid-afternoon and never really use any of the ideal ISO settings. Why did we do this? We know what the camera looks like with the ideal ISO, and quite often you need to increase your ISO outside the typical range just through the normal course of shooting. But this can be a real pain point, especially if you're working professionally, and you want to be sure that higher ISOs can still match more or less the majority of what you've been shooting. On most cameras, shooting higher non-native ISO images can look significantly worse, really different than shooting at the native ISO and providing the camera with enough light. Shooting during the bright day gave us a lot more mid-tones and a lot more variation in those tones compared to shooting at night. We purposely chose dark wardrobe for Caitlin so that she would always have some darker, more shadowed areas on camera. Look at these areas in particular to see what the noise looks like, also up in the hills. We purposely pushed the noise level up to what we would feel would be uh, a likely extended ISO range that someone would, would work with, and we wanted to see what it would look like at the edge of acceptability. Especially if you're planning to finish for a large screen. Our goal was not to spend hours trying to recover or fix the images in post either, so nothing you're about to see has any noise reduction applied. If you're looking at some of this footage right now, it has between two and four stops of additional and unnecessary noise in the midtones and shadows. That noise would be greatly reduced if the camera was rated properly. But you tell me, is this unacceptable? I think the images are rather fantastic and certainly wouldn't call them unusable. But if you watch a lot of camera tests that purport to show uh, recoverable image information, they might also easily conclude that those same ISOs are unusable. We also did a degree of stress test shooting at T4 and 12,800 ISO. Why didn't we go higher? Uh, we could have, but 12,800 is so fast and so clean that someone standing in front of a black and dark gray mural illuminated by only one small architectural LED had so much exposure, it looks positively beyond what you might find in many films that couldn't afford a lighting package just a few years ago. Which means if you wanted to shoot a movie with just people standing under streetlights, you absolutely could. And what does it look like when we added in a dimmed down two foot LED tube? Well, if you're not careful, your movie could easily start to look overlit. I'm gonna say something potentially controversial. And that is, if you are shooting narrative, in only the rarest circumstances should you consider shooting above 12,800 ISO with the FX3. Why? The 12,800 ISO setting, which is the high native setting, is incredible. The noise is similar to the FX3 at 2000. And while there's a modest reduction in overall chroma information, this is easily compensated for in color correction. It goes without saying that if you care about the quality of what you're shooting, always default to increasing your light level versus increasing ISO. You'll probably even wanna add ND filters at the 12,800 setting and bring it down rather than shoot at an ISO like 6400. Unlike the FX9 and FX6, the FX3 has in-body stabilization. That means you can make use of optical, in-body, and software-based image stabilization. And all of these levels of stabilization perform better or worse depending on the kind of camera shake going on. If you're going to rely on any of these forms over using a gimbal or Steadicam, just know that you should do your own tests to make sure the results are acceptable to you and software-based image stabilization should always be the last resort. I would say that a well-planned out shot, competently executed, that takes advantage of these stabilization methods appropriately, will deliver amazing results. But this is also highly breakable. If you don't test, and by test I mean know what kind of shake you can get away with on set, these tools might leave you with less than ideal results. Do your own tests, and you will end up with shots like these, or better. All of this was shot handheld, and I would say it looks like some kind of stabilizing device was used. So Dane, who is this camera for? It's really for anyone who owns a Venice FX9 or FX6 who wants a tiny camera that matches those cameras and performs at a level beyond what you should expect from any sub $4,000 camera. It's also much more usable than the A7S III in a cinematic context. So what do we miss? We have not talked about the Sony app. 
You're right, Sony has the Imaging Edge free application that works within an Android or iDevice and sends a very low latency image to your phone wirelessly. And uh, you can control most functions of the camera. So if you're stuck without a system to monitor video, you can actually just turn on the app and it'll give you a relatively good idea of what the camera is seeing. And depending on your distance and movement, it's, it's quite capable. You can, you can control the, the functions of the camera. Well, I think that just about does it for us. So uh, YouTube is new for us, and uh, I'm not sure if anyone finds this useful or helpful, but if you do, please like, subscribe, and leave us a comment. Thanks so much for watching.